Welcome to Trust Talk. Our guest today is Tom Vandermeer, a political science professor from the University of Amsterdam. He's an expert in political trust, social connections, and voting patterns. Tom highlights the historical importance of political trust since post-World War II. He explains that the idea of a continuous decline in trust isn't entirely accurate. Trust levels vary across regions and times. He shares an interesting idea. When people lose trust due to poor government performance, it might actually motivate them to get more involved in democracy, like voting and protesting. This can lead to positive change. Tom also explores what shapes political trust. He breaks down reasons like fair institutions, electoral systems, and education's impact. He discusses the link between corruption and trust, showing how corruption hurts trustworthiness and the importance of fairness in countering it. Tom talks about how politicians talk about trust and the connection between populism and political trust. He points out that the two aren't always directly linked, but trust affects how people vote and which parties they support. When asked about Francis Fukuyama's view on populist politicians and distrust in institutions, Tom partially agrees, but adds nuance. He challenges the idea that populism always arises from declining trust, pointing out examples like modern populism emerging in high-trust countries. He also notes that the connection between rising populism and decreasing trust isn't always direct, as events and trust fluctuations don't consistently match Fukuyama's theory. Tom does share agreement with Fukuyama on the growing politicization of political trust. He observes that voters now choose parties based on trust levels, a change from the past where trusters and distrusters often voted for the same parties. Tom highlights the role of polarization and ideology in shaping party dynamics. He's concerned not just about overall trust levels, but also how trust is distributed across parties. He warns that parties dominated by distrusting individuals could lead to challenges, like questioning election legitimacy, as seen in the United States. Your host today, Severin DeWitt. Tom, welcome to Trust Talk. I'm excited to have you on the show today, especially since you have extensively written about political trust. In this episode, we want to dive into the subject of political trust and its impact on the quality of representative democracy. As far back as 1774, in Edmund Burke's Reflections on the Revolution in France, trust in the good judgment of political representatives has been presented as an essential feature of democratic practice. First of all, thanks for having me. It's a delight to be here. And indeed, this theme that we're going to discuss, so the, the impact of political trust on the quality of representative democracy has been a theme ever since, uh, particularly after the Second World War, by the way. The post-war scholars were very concerned with the stability or rather the instability of democratic regimes. Since a lot of these American and European scholars in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s focused on what they called the civic culture and on public support and the fear that they had that People would disengage from politics, disengage from democracy, and thereby undermine democracy itself. They really looked into the, the popular roots of democratic support, hence also on political trust. Over the past four decades, I think we have witnessed a decline in political trust. How has this decline affected the quality of representative democracy? First, I am not so sure about the premise of the question. The scholarly literature is not at all uniform that there is this systematic decline in political trust. Different studies have aimed to reassess this age-old claim. And quite a few of the recent ones, uh, by Pippa Morris, by Van Ham and Thomas, uh, by Falkart, Sommer and Define, did not really find this trend. Yet, an even more recent study, by the way, by Again, Falkert, Son, Define, and Jennings, that suggests that there might be an overall decline after all, but not that large. Now, in, in my interpretation, some regions have indeed experienced a structural decline in political trust. Just think about the United States between 1960 and 1980, or Central and Eastern Europe after their democratic transition, or Spain and France in the last decade. But for other countries and other regions, it's not so clear that there we mainly see fluctuations, but trendless fluctuations. Nevertheless, I mean, your, your question was about the consequences, right? And the consequences 
can still be plenty because we know that when trust is low, compliance with the law tends to be lower. When trust is low, people are more likely to have volatile vote intentions. They more easily shift from one party to another. Or when people participate and they are distrusters, they are more likely to engage in protest behavior. Now, of course, not all of this is bad for democracy. In that respect, I think one of the themes in my work has been that we should try to distinguish between trust and distrust as a disposition, like blindly trusting politicians or the system, blindly distrusting the system regardless of how it functions, and trust and distrust as an outcome of skepticism, which you could call trust or distrust based on evaluation. And a lot of the concerns for the state of democracy are basically with blind distrust. That's citizens who disengage from their democratic institutions, uh, regardless of the way that these institutions function. But theoretically, at least, we should be less concerned when political trust declines in response to a declining institutional performance. Then it's a good thing that people start to trust less. And then it's a good thing that people start to protest more because it's a response to declining performance. And that is a way by which citizens can then reinvigorate politics. In their publication, The Crisis of Democracy by Michel Croger, Samuel Huntington and Georgi Watanuki, they emphasize the importance of public trust in democratic governance for the function of democracy. What are your thoughts on the concerns that have emerged over the years about the crisis in representative democracy? Basically, their claim consists of two big assumptions. First is that there is a decline or a structural decline in public support. And the second is that public trust matters for democracy. Now, let's deal with the first, uh, this decline assumption. It has been a narrative that has continued to be dominant for the last 50 years, particularly outside of political trust research. So you see a lot of people revert to this idea whenever trust goes down. And trust does go down, right, in response to whatever happens in, in the real world. And just in recent years, to think about influential philosophers like Sigmund Bauman or Ivan Krastev that state that there is a systematic decline in political trust over the years. Now, on the one hand, this idea has spurred a lot of research. So there has been a big project in the 1990s that aimed to test whether trust was indeed in decline, finding not so much. And there have been tests and retests since. But on the other hand, after 50 years of debate whether or not trust is in decline, I think this has turned into a perpetual debate with very little theoretical progress because every time trust goes down, the concern comes up again and we have to go back into this debate whether or not there is a structural decline again. I think this second assumption that trust matters, that trust is important, is the more interesting one. But surprisingly, it has remained an assumption for a very, very long time. We as trust scholars all tend to work in the idea that trust matters. And of course, I mean, trust matters. It matters to voters. They behave differently if they lose trust. It matters to politicians. They act differently if they think trust is low. Different types of parties can be selected based on low levels of trust. But the big question, I think, really still is how relevant is trust and distrust for democracy itself? Do trust and distrust in government or in parliament make that much of a difference and that largely is an assumption and it's an assumption that i also make myself right in, in my very first international publication on, on political trust i call trust something like the oil that lubricates the policy machine and the glue that keeps society together <laughs> so if i can say so myself it's great phrasing and it has been picked up by others but i did not test that assumption in that paper and only, I think, in recent years, various scholars have been working towards analysis to test this overarching question, which is really the core of it. So we know quite a bit about the consequences for voters, increasingly more about the consequences for parties, but very little about democracy itself. Political trust is known to be strongly related to perceptions of performance, accountability, impartiality and corruption. Can you explain how that works? There are two ways I think that, that are relevant here. So first, conceptually, I mean, this whole podcast is about trust. But let's take a step back and 
consider what trust is. Now, trust is an attitude of support, but it's more than just support, right? It, it's support that can only exist in a situation of uncertainty or risk. That means that trust is a trait of a relationship. Social trust, for instance, I, I could trust you not to turn off my microphone while I'm passionately debating trust. Saying that tells us that trust is part of our relationship and that you have some form of power over me. If I say I trust you, I thereby say that I support you, but also that you have some power over me. Yeah, that's the, the vulnerability that often shows up when we discuss trust. Exactly. That's inherent to trust. And, and particularly in social psychology, people have considered, well, under which conditions are you more likely to support in a condition of risk or vulnerability? And then... I really like an article from the 1990s by Kasperson et al. that basically make a typology saying, well, there are four big reasons. You can trust because the other is competent to act to your favor, because you think that the other one cares for you inherently, that the other is committed to you because you can hold him or her accountable, or finally, because the other is reliable. We know from past experiences that the other can be trusted. All of these criteria can be easily translated to politics. So competence can be shown simply by policy output. Care is a way of interest alignment. So if the politicians that are in power align with those that you prefer, there's likely more of a care relationship. Commitment can be viewed from the point of view of if politicians do not act according to your interest, we as voters can dismiss them. That's the whole reason in representative democracy why we organize elections every four years. And finally, reliability is based on past experiences. So these can be translated to the political realm. And once you do that, you can see that various of these traits do have an impact on trust. Why? Well, the state, state institutions, politicians, they are basically the object of trust because trust is a relationship. You, you would expect these objects to matter. And based on this typology from social psychology, you can easily relate to various aspects. And that brings me to my second answer to your question here. The way I tend to phrase it, by and large, there are three big types of object-driven explanations. So first, there are the structural explanations. It's like the boat that floats on the ocean, that keeps us afloat, that keeps trust levels relatively high. And by far, the most important explanation is impartiality, the impartiality of the executive or lack of corruption. That is by far the most important explanation. And second to that is having a proportional electoral system. Why? In a proportional electoral system, even people that tend to be more distrusting towards politicians, for instance, people on the flanks, tend to have parties that represent them within parliament. And that matters because you keep on being connected to these institutions. So your levels of trust tend to be higher. Sometimes your party even tends to be part of government itself or support government. So you keep connected to that system. Um, whereas, for instance, in the British system, with its majoritarian approach, there are still a lot of people on the flanks, but they don't get that same level of representation. The United Kingdom Independence Party in 2015 got approximately 13% of the votes, comparable to the Sweden Democrats in Sweden, to the Freedom Party in the Netherlands. But in the UK, UKIP only got one out of 650 seats in Parliament, less than 0.2 of a percent. That doesn't really make you feel represented, right? So that puts you on the outskirts of trust, make you less likely to trust. And other factors like education, migration and priorities of non-material values, how do, how do they impact? Those are more like the subject-driven explanations. They tend to be more related to the subjects. And, and if you let me, I'll, I'll come to that in a sec. But if we first stick to the object-driven explanations, so how politicians perform, Besides these structural explanations, there are the, the more temporal explanations. It's like the ebb and flow of the tides on which our boat is floating. And then the economy matters. So the economy matters because people compare the state of their economy to the past state of the economy. When the economy goes well, trust goes up. When the economy goes down, trust goes down. And then also big scandals factor in. So like these endemic scandals, the receipt scandal in the United Kingdom, the long 60s and 70s with political murders and corruption and Vietnam, Watergate in the United States, the big scandals in Belgium in the 1990s, they have long-lasting effects. 
And then below that, there are the short-term explanations, object-driven like the waves. They can be big events like COVID or 9-11. They can be the image of a specific politician or a specific government. But those are by and large the object-driven explanations. Now, you move towards these, these subject-driven explanations. I really think education is incredibly interesting here. Education is like a key factor theoretically. By and large, if you, if you want to explain why individuals tend to trust or distrust, there are two big clusters of theories. There are the socialization theories. They are subject-centric. They st- basically state that we all tend to grow up with certain norms and attitudes, and you can grow up to be a trusting person or a distrusting person. And next to that, we've got the evaluative model that's more object-centric. That basically means that people's trust is mainly a response to how politics or democracy itself performs. And education is very interesting because it's like the interaction between the two. Because education suggests that people who are more highly educated tend to have been socialized, stating that we should be monitoring politics, that there are certain democratic values that that politicians should adhere to. And that makes high educated people more likely to evaluate democracy and evaluate politics on its own terms. And there have been various studies, most intriguingly by Armin Akferdi and Quinton Main, uh, that show that in well-performing countries, the higher educated are more likely to trust politics than the lower educated. But in badly performing countries, highly corrupt countries, low-income countries, etc., but particularly highly corrupt countries, the effect disappears or even inverts. So in the most corrupt countries in their studies, they find the inverse. There, the high educated tend to have less trust in politics than the lower educated. So the high educated, their attitudes, they depend more on how government, how democracy itself actually functions. So education really is a a very interesting key factor here. Tom, you just mentioned the corruption. How does corruption influence political trust, considering its negative consequences, such as reduced efficiency, lack of effectiveness, compromised moral values, institutionalized lack of accountability, and the resulting uncertainty and inequality at both broader society levels and individual interactions? I think it's the previous podcast that you had with uh, Rick Eslaner who is, of course, the the main scholar on corruption, inequality, and trust. So to some extent, I'll probably echo what he's already said, but corruption is almost like the antithesis of trustworthiness in all of the ways that you just described, right? If we think about competence and care and commitment and reliability, corruption is like the inverse of all of those because corruption hinders the competence of a system to really act decisively. If a government is corrupt, it clearly doesn't care for you. If a government is corrupt, it's very difficult to hold government accountable because the system itself is corrupt. And if government is corrupt, it's very difficult to predict whether or not you will have your say and whether or not you can implement your own individual rights. So it really is the antithesis of trustworthiness. And moreover, as you also just described, it has all these side effects. It hampers performance, it raises inequality, etc. So it's quite difficult to pick apart what specific element of corruption matters most. But I've done a study on this. And in that study, the most important factor tended to be the lack of impartiality. So corruption has all of these elements. But if push comes to the shove, it's not a lack of professionalism or whatever. It's the impartiality that most directly affects political trust. So impartiality of the executive being able to protect your own individual rights in an impartial way, that's the one that matters the most in that study. But to be sure, it's very difficult to pick it apart because corruption is encompassing and it is the antithesis of trust. One of the research projects you did demonstrated the dynamic interaction between citizens and the state. What were some notable findings emerging from your study? There are quite a few. I I think one of the things that's interesting here about these consequences of political trust. Let me raise two. First, when it comes to voting behavior and trust and the consequences for the system. So what we know is that what we found in our studies, if trust goes down, people are more likely to 
have more volatile voting tensions. They're more likely to move away from the incumbent parties towards parties on the flanks. But subsequently, the party system responds to that. There are new parties that come up to, that try to mobilize distrust in voters, but they're in coalition uh, systems, coalitions have to be formed, but that's more difficult because people are more volatile, move to different types of parties. So it's more difficult to form a new coalition government. But in response to a new government, people are able to lose trust again. So they will probably move towards newer parties again, thereby reinforcing that dynamic that distrusters can be mobilized towards new parties. New parties come up, are not necessarily part of the new coalition government. New coalition government tends to lose trust whilst running, thereby moving more people towards the flanks. That's a very interesting dynamic interaction, I think. Another one is the effect that trust has on support for various decision-making models. So what we find in our studies about these consequences of trust is that when people lose trust, they change their preferences for the system itself. And for a very long time, going back to the uh, Cogier et al. reports that you mentioned earlier, there, there was this idea that, that distrusting voters would become more authoritarian. That is not what we find. What we find in our research, and we've done panel studies in four countries over quite a long time span, what we find is that people who lose trust, they move away from the status quo, so they want to change the status quo, but they primarily move towards direct democratic elements in favor of referenda, of in favor of more directly elected prime minister, for instance. So they favor that. So people's response to their own distrust is that they move towards more democracy. That relates to the, the by now 120 year old idea. I think it was Jane Adams who mentioned that basically the cure to the ills of democracy is more democracy. Well, our findings suggest that that is indeed the lived experience of quite a few people. But it's interesting because the response of politicians towards rising distrust is not necessarily more direct democracy, right? So there's a very interesting dynamic in that respect. And if there's a mismatch between citizens and incumbents, well, there are always new challenger parties, at least in multi-party systems, that are able to capitalize on that, that are able to mobilize distrusting voters. For instance, populist parties that do push for more direct democratic elements. In an earlier episode, I interviewed Francis Fukuyama. He said, and I'm quoting him, uh, and an apology, it's a long quote. In many democracies, you have the rise of populist politicians who are outsiders that claim that all of the established parties, the established media, represent an elite that doesn't have the interest of the broad mass of people in mind when they act. And they actually deliberately try to foster distrust of those institutions. That's part of their method of gaining power for themselves. And sometimes it's rooted in a certain degree of truth that elites can lose sight of the views of ordinary people. End of quote. Would you feel the same way? Uh, yes and no. I do not think his argument aligns with timing, location, but there is something going on. Let me first explain why I disagree. So in Northwestern Europe, modern populism came up as an electoral force first and foremost in high trust countries with a proportional electoral system like Denmark or the Netherlands and not so much in countries with somewhat lower levels of trust like the UK or Germany. And often in these countries, populism did not grow on the flow of rising distrust, but rather by mobilizing already distrusting voters. Now, Fukuyama made similar comments about the Netherlands 13 years ago, but even then it did not hold. And all the events in between cannot relate fluctuations in political trust to the dynamic that he describes. So I think it's an interesting claim, but I do not see much evidence empirically. But where I agree, it's perhaps more interesting, it is my impression that political trust is becoming increasingly political. In multi-party systems, voters segment themselves into different parties, increasingly based on their trust in politics. So in the past, trusters and distrusters would tend to vote for the same parties. They would find each other in social democratic parties or in Christian democratic parties or liberal conservative parties. But now they increasingly vote for different parties. So trusters tend to go for post-materialist parties. Distrusters tend to vote for populists. And in the US, we see a similar phenomenon, right? But added to that, there are the high level of polarization 
the ideological screen of seeing your party in power or not adds to this phenomenon. And that means that the trusters and distrusters tend to vote for different parties nowadays. And that's a change compared to the past. And my concern, therefore, is not so much with the average level of political trust, but rather its politicization, its distribution. Because you can imagine if the voters of some parties tend to consist largely of structural distrusters, we still can expect risks to arise because these voters are more likely to be mobilized when their party elites, their politicians, publicly cast doubt on the legitimacy of election results, for instance, as we have seen in the United States. So there is still a risk, but it's a different one than I think you just mentioned. Tom, uh, we are both Dutch, so it's logical that we uh, also talk about the situation in our own country, in the Netherlands. It seems that the word trust has become ubiquitous among politicians and political journalists to the point where it becomes what we call in Dutch a stoplap, or I think in English you'd better say the word cliché. So what happens in Dutch politics with trust? I think it's a broader problem. It not necessarily relates purely to the Netherlands, but by and large, I agree. It has become a bit of a cliché in any form of public debate, not just among politicians, but we so often hear and read that A, undermines trust, or B, irreparably damages trust. But, well, we've done some research. I've done some research with colleagues, A.V. Steenvoorde, Erika van Elsas, uh, Atle Houtskeert, on members of parliament. And there, it seems to be the case that this is mainly part of a strategy, a strategy to underpin the relevance of what is being said by these MPs rather than a substantive analysis in itself. Is that a big problem? Not sure. I'm always quite concerned with the idea that if we keep on telling ourselves that trust is going down, even when it's not, then that probably will reinforce the idea that trust is going down and that could have its own consequences. Public opinion is pessimistic. We think the past used to be better and the future tends to be worse. And this is not unique to Europe or unique to our times. This is something that has been quite common for centuries upon centuries. Now, the bigger concern that I have when it's about trust as a cliche is that trust can also be abused. And it might be weird for me to say so as a trust scholar, but trust in politics is not really a goal in itself. We want to support democracy, but what's good for democracy is not necessarily good for political trust. Take, for instance, transparency. Transparency is a good thing. But transparency in a situation of corruption doesn't lead to more trust. But it's good for democracy itself. So we should always keep in mind that the end goal is democracy. It's not necessarily trust. Because there are quite a few ways by which, in the short run, we could stimulate trust, even though it's not at the benefit of democracy itself. Politicians could play games strengthening their public image in the newspapers. Or they could create crisis because we know that crises tend to have an effect as long as if they are external, they have the effect by which people tend to flock towards politicians as a form of defense. That's not what you want in a democracy. We want to defend democracy. And if that leads to less trust, that's not a problem. The most important thing for trust is that we want trust that's not so much uh, a standard outlook on life, a standard attitude, but rather we want to have trust that's based on an evaluation, that's based on monitoring. A democracy requires skepticism regarding the elites and the institutions rather than trust. Tom, I end my interviews normally with the same question uh, I'm also asking you. What are the challenges, in your view, for political young political scientists for the coming years? I really think that for young political scientists, the field is opening up immensely. By now, we have a lot of means to study political trust in ways other than via survey research. So there are elite interviews, we've got panel studies, there are online analyses. So we can really broaden up our views on trust research. Similarly, all these assumptions that political trust scholars have held for decades are being questioned. So I really think the field is opening up. And therefore, the biggest challenge might be, ironically, 
that it's more difficult than in the past to keep an overview of the whole field because there are so many subfields and there are so many sub parts that you might want to take into account. Tom, thank you very much for being available for our podcast. I wish you all the best and good luck with your future studies. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Trust Talk. We hope that you found the conversation valuable and informative. At Trust Talk, we believe in the power of trust to create positive change in the world. If you believe in our mission, we would greatly appreciate your support. You can help keep Trust Talk going by making a donation on our website at trusttalk.co slash donate. Every contribution, no matter how small, helps us to continue bringing you thoughtful and engaging podcasts. Thank you for your support and for listening to Trust Talk. We look forward to meeting you again for future episodes. Thank you.